Hello, and welcome to my series on the CT of thoracoabdominal emergencies. I'm Dr. Benjamin Strong, the Chief Medical Officer of Virtual Radiologic, or VRAD. I started my career with an internal medicine residency and followed that with three years of work as an emergency physician. I then returned to training for a radiology residency and a fellowship in body and MSK MRI. In the course of my over 20 years in radiology, I have worked as a private practice radiologist, an academic radiologist, and for the last 17 years as a teleradiologist for VRAD. I have been the chief medical officer there for eight years and am licensed to practice in all 50 states. Here is our agenda for this series, which I have broken into nine sessions of eight cases each, all grouped by organ system. Session eight, renal emergencies. We'll start with a relatively straightforward case of pyonephrosis or pyelonephritis superimposed on stone disease. So there is the renal cortical hypodensity, so characteristic of pyelonephritis. When you see that, you must make certain that you look for small, subtle stones uh, causing the precipitating obstruction. Here you can see the hypodense cortex of the kidney, multiple locations, a little perinephric stranding as well, a dilated ureter, and that small obstructing stone. Remember, even the small stones have a tendency to obstruct. In fact, even disproportionately to large stones. The theory behind that is that the uh, mobility of a smaller stone within the ureter actually causes more mural swelling and thus contributes to a greater likelihood for obstruction. Here we have on the coronals, again, that cortical hypodensity and the small obstructing stone. Very nice wedge-shaped, striated appearance to the cortex there, and another focus posteriorly. So that is a case of pyonephrosis. Our next case is another pyonephrosis, but this one in a patient with horseshoe kidney. Patients with horseshoe kidneys have a tendency to stone formation and anatomic obstruction of their collecting systems. This patient actually had both. We start here with this dilated collecting system, more pronounced on the right than the left, but present throughout. And here you can see the wedge-shaped striated hypodensity, characteristic of pyelonephritis here in the posterior left kidney. This patient happens to have a thick, Parenchymal isthmus, not always the case. Of course, this portion can be fibrous as well, but it's a real treat here because you can see the striated hypodensity is affecting that parenchyma there as well. A case of pyelonephritis in a horseshoe kidney isthmus, something you won't see every day. More inferiorly, you can appreciate bilateral ureteral dilation, and so it is no surprise to find a thick-walled bladder with significant uh, stone disease, essentially gravel in the dependent portion of the bladder. So here we have the dilated collecting systems and the striated parenchyma, typical of pyelonephritis, and bilateral ureteral dilation leading down to a stone-filled thick-walled bladder. There again, the pyelonephritis, and specifically involving the parenchymal isthmus of a horseshoe kidney. So that is a case of pyonephrosis in a horseshoe kidney. Our next case was a CT scan where we were lucky enough to be able to diagnose hyperparathyroidism. So this patient 
presented with right flank pain, and you can see there is dilation of the right collecting system, and a very small amount of perinephric stranding to call your attention to it. Here you're helped with a little asymmetry and can spot a little hydroureter. And at the level of the bladder, you can see a rounded calcification at the ureterovesicular junction, consistent with a non-obstructing stone. You can even appreciate a little ureteral jet of contrast there, proving that it is uh, incompletely obstructing. Here it is on bone windows to let you better appreciate that small calcification. But the definitive diagnosis of hyperparathyroidism rests on this, the subperiosteal resorption of the iliac aspects of the sacroiliac joints. You won't see it much better than that, and I have to say it is worth checking the sacroiliac joints of every stone disease patient you see. You'll come across this at least once a year. So here is the perinephric stranding and hydronephrosis, hydroureter, and the incompletely obstructing stone with a ureteral jet. Very nicely demonstrated. And here, the subperiosteal resorption on the iliac aspect of the sacroiliac joints. This patient was diagnosed with hyperparathyroidism on the basis of this scan and was found to have a sky-high parathyroid level, ultimately traced to a parathyroid adenoma in the neck. Our next case is of emphysematous pyelonephritis. A surgical emergency is seen almost exclusively in diabetic patients. There is anterior and lateral cortical hypodensity, as well as a generalized diminished nephrogram throughout this involved left kidney. You can see there is extensive perinephric stranding, of course, as well. But the most important finding, the diagnostic finding, is this gas within the collecting system. Here on the coronal, you can appreciate that as well, asymmetric nephrograms with regional diminished perfusion, perinephric stranding, and of course extensive gas outlining the entire collecting system. Here you can really appreciate the generalized diminished nephrogram, but also the regional involvement in the anterior and lateral renal cortex. Note again, extensive perinephric stranding and of course, the collecting system gas. On the coronals, you can also appreciate a little gas within the bladder, a common finding in association with emphysematous pyelonephritis. Isolated gas within the bladder is less concerning, emphysematous cystitis obviously being more easily survived and not restricted to the diabetic patient population. But in this setting with emphysematous pyelonephritis, that's clearly not the primary pathology. So that is a case of emphysematous pyelonephritis. Our next case is of bland renal vein thrombosis. This is a common presentation in dehydrated or otherwise ill patients, and it presents here as significant renal enlargement with significant perinephric stranding. You can also see a diminished asymmetrically reduced uh, nephrogram as well. But here is the critical finding that filling defect within the right renal vein, which sometimes can be tricky to identify. Here on the coronal, you can see again the renal enlargement and perinephric stranding. And here, that extensive filling defect extending all the way through the length of the renal vein and even into the IVC. Here it is on the axial. Note that renal vein filling defect 
and the obvious asymmetric enlargement of the right kidney with a reduced nephrogram. And let's look at that on the coronal. You can really appreciate the extent of that renal vein filling defect here, extending again all the way into the IVC. So that is a case of renal vein thrombosis. Our next case is of a massive renal artery aneurysm rupture. Here it is with arterial contrast density, as well as those small peripheral calcifications that are so helpful in the diagnosis of an arterial aneurysm. There is obviously extensive perinephric fluid, suggesting a relatively acute rupture of that aneurysm. And here more inferiorly, you can appreciate both the aneurysm with its peripheral calcifications and also the active extravasation coming from its posterior inferior aspect. Here you can track it along the course of the right renal artery. And again, those peripheral calcifications so helpful in identifying this as an arterial aneurysm. And you can appreciate inferiorly here the active extravasation on the posterior aspect. That is a case of a large renal artery aneurysm with acute rupture. Our next case is of granulomatosis with polyangiitis, an entity I have always known as Wegener's granulomatosis. So this one presents with multiple small aneurysms within both the liver and the kidneys. So you can see them here, these tiny focal contrast collections along the course of the hepatic arteries. On this higher image, we're getting a, just our first view of a large left perinephric hematoma. More inferiorly, we see those small contrast collections within both kidneys, again representing renal artery aneurysms, and a large posterior juxtanephric collection with layering density consistent with a subacute or acute hematoma. So there are the small hepatic aneurysms large juxtanephric hematoma, and a number of small renal aneurysms as well. But the definitive finding here allowing the diagnosis of Wegener's even just on scan information is this small cavitary lesion we caught in the lung base, another manifestation of Wegener's and a finding that really brings this whole case all together. So there is that one lesion that helped us uh, seal this diagnosis. So that is a case of granulomatosis with polyangiitis, presenting as an acute juxtanephric hematoma. Our last case in this session is of hemorrhagic angiomyolipomas. Angiomyolipomas are fairly common in middle-aged women and I'm sure everyone knows are frequently multiple and bilateral. They can present with acute hemorrhage such as in this case. You can see the renal parenchyma is essentially replaced with these fat density masses throughout both kidneys, but it's on the left kidney that we're particularly concerned where we see a perinephric density that is consistent with a perinephric hemorrhage. More inferiorly, we can appreciate, again, more of those fatty masses replacing the renal parenchyma, but that layering density within this hyperdense uh, fluid collection, consistent with a large hematoma. And here again, almost no discernible normal renal parenchyma present and extensive hyperdense fluid with layering 
consistent with acute hemorrhage, they're surrounding the left kidney and extending to its inferior aspect. So multiple angiomyolipomas, of course, are associated with tuberous sclerosis, but they can happen independent of that, as was the case in this particular patient. That is a case of multiple angiomyolipomas presenting with acute hemorrhage. And that concludes Session 8, Renal Emergencies. Thanks for watching.